Jumbo Scampi for limited All for a price that will make you I will fight him. You're listening to Banff, UK Comic Book Radio. Hello everyone, welcome to Banff Comic Book Radio, the weekly comics podcast where you can find news, reviews and odd points of views. I am one of your many hosts this week, uh, Bertie Kempson, and joining me are the fabulous foursome of Lucas. Say hello, Lucas. Howdy. Fee, say hello, Fee. Hello. Devs, say hello, Devs. Whatcha? And Sarah, say hello, Sarah. Hello. Okay, this week is a bit of a special this week. We are talking, because we've all seen it, uh, of Man of Steel. It's the movie review, it's the big blockbuster everyone's been waiting for. The massive Jesus Cape Man film. Let's get into it, guys. Who wants to open us up on the floor, busting the moves? <laughs> well, um, I was really, really looking forward to this film. I've liked all the other Superman films including the Christopher Reed fourth one with the nuclear guy and the Brandon Ruth Superman Returns one. So I was of the opinion that I would really, really like any Superman film on the basis of the Superman. And I was absolutely fine with this one up until a certain point towards the end, um, which was basically the point where he ended up killing Zod, which I just think it, it's Superman. Superman isn't meant to be... He's not meant to do that. He's meant to find a way around everything. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I I was okay with the change of Lois knowing, um, yeah, I was fine with Lois knowing, working out who Clark was with his powers beforehand. I was fine with the change of the Krypton story and when he got sent off um, by his parents. I was fine. I, I loved the bits about all the animals on Krypton and the architecture and all the birth stuff. That was absolutely fine. Um, but I had a huge, huge problem with Superman killing Zod because... I just think Superman is talking about a symbol, he's meant to be about hope, he's meant to be the best that we can be, and then he kills somebody without finding another way around it, and I just thought that was awful, and that made me think that I'm not watching a Superman film. And, yeah, no, not not happy at all. <laughs> I don't really want to see it again. I've seen every other superhero film many times, but I have no interest in seeing this. I am really, really, really disappointed about it. <laughs> I think other people online I've spoken to are as well. Um, I don't know what your guys' views are about it, but it's really, really not what I thought it would be. <laughs> Lucas, what did you think? Try my sin on this. Okay, well, as as a guy who hasn't really uh, read anything kind of Superman, I was seeing this just because it was a Superman movie that I was hoping was going to be better than Superman Returns. And it it was. It felt... it. The whole film did feel a bit doom and gloom up until the uh, the last the last act I I liked Henry Cavill's Superman he was um he was good I didn't think that he looked the part but other than that it was all fine Lois Lane as well the uh, the actress who played her if anybody knows Amy Adams Amy Adams I didn't think that she was a great Lois Lane there was just something about kind of throughout the film. But uh my highlight of the film is of Zod. He has my favourite line in the film, which I'll save for uh, the end of the podcast. But he was absolutely fantastic. But he died at the end of the film. And Superman killed him, and it wasn't cool. It's, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure Superman's killed before, as uh, we were speaking earlier. But still, just the way he did it, I'm sure as a, as a hero he could have found another way... And also, there was a whole load of, like, buildings getting destroyed during the end fight scene, which Superman just didn't seem to care that he'd just been punched for a building or punched Zod for a building, and, like, a million people just died. But other than that, it was a, it was a good film, <laughs> and uh, I'd wait for the sequel to see what they do. It's similar to Batman Begins, where it was a... Uh, I'm going to make that comparison as well. Similar to Batman Begins, it kind of... It wasn't, like, an, an amazingly amazing film... But the sequel is probably going to be really good. So, go on, Nevs. Let's hear what you think. So, um, 
I went through this thing a while ago where I was going to lots of gigs and thinking maybe I was just like, maybe I was too old for music, right? And I was watching bands and I was like, maybe I don't care anymore. And then I went to see Fishbone last year. I was like, oh no, I haven't been, I haven't grown out of music. I've just been watching really bad bands. And, um, I've been, you know, sitting through your Avengers Assembles and your Iron Mans and your Spider-Mans and your X-Men's First Class and just going, wow, these are really boring films. And maybe, because I was really hesitant when I went to watch Superman, I was like, sorry, Man of Steel, it's like, wow, this this is probably be kind of dull. And I thought the Superman Returns movie was basically the first Superman movie, but on really powerful, dull Prozac. And none of the people who played in the parts of Superman's Returns had any of the pizzazz or the energy of the guys of the Christopher Reeve movie. So I was kind of dreading this. And I totally loved every single second out of Man of Steel because so many reasons. It explains to you exactly what it would be like to have superpowers. There's the bits where they're actually like filming Superman flying across is shot at such a speed that you get the idea of what it feels like to have that much wind in your hair. Everyone's motivations are so well defined. Zod's not just that I'm being evil for the sake of being evil. He's actually a political person who's got an angle and everything. It makes sense. The, one of the things that's bugged me about the Kryptonian Superman mythos is why would you ignore Jor-El's philosophy? Why, when Jor-El says to the Kryptonian council, hey, look, I've worked it out. The whole planet's going to be destroyed. Why would you... This isn't like David Icke or Alex Jones saying, oh, there are space lizards taking over the world. This is like a Stephen Hawking level of scientist. And they just all, all through every single interpretation, they've gone like, well, jor is stupid. And actually, no, he's not stupid in this. The whole thing is tied into a beautiful analogy for the sake of using oil as a, re, as a resource for the planet. And it works beautifully. The fight scenes are incredible and actually convey the energy and the power of what's going on. And, yeah, all right, yes. I, I seem to have become, by default, the resident Superman expert of the show. So, yes, actually, Superman has killed the four. He killed, like, the Phantom Zone criminals, went completely crazy about it, and installed himself to space and dressed up as Brian Blessed for a year or something. But um, the thing to bear in mind, right, with Clark killing Zod, is it's the first major adventure... He ever has as Superman. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't have all the training and all the higher ground. I mean, at one point, he's trying not to punch some dude's face off because the guys dropped beer over him. I think everyone was... I mean, it was fantastic. For me, the revelation of the movie, besides the dog and the bear, I was so glad they got a polar bear joke in there for no reason, except for everyone just go, oh yeah, one of those producers was really stupid. Um, Kevin Costner keeps that movie together. And this is the guy from, like, The Postman and Waterworld. And, like, this guy's acting his chops off. He's the best person I've ever seen play Paul Kent through Superman Returns and Superman and Lois and Clark. You know? So, for me, absolute blinder. Blew every Marvel movie this century out of the window. Cannot wait to go and see it again. Fantastic from start to finish. Um, if... If the whole idea is that, like, Man of Steel is a bad movie because Superman wouldn't act that way, well, the thing you have to bear in mind is it's an interpretation of the Superman mythos. It's not, like, a sacrosanct text that must be followed from plot point to plot point. Sometimes Supes gets it wrong. That's always been a theme, you know, that too much power. It can just go completely wrong. And a lot of the time is spent of him just not doing anything. So, yeah, in summary... Man of Steel, absolutely best superhero movie this century, without a doubt. Well, Pete, I can see you're up. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm next. I'm blown away now, actually. I think all of us are that you actually liked it. Yep, I'm like shocked. Uh, I can barely, uh. <laughs> Speechless over here. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'm gonna <laughs> struggle speaking now. Um, right, I'm just gonna put that out of my mind. Uh, I'm gonna say I loved it as well. I loved every second of it. Every single two and a half hours worth of it. The only downside was that it was a bit long, but I loved it. The acting was so brilliant. The film was so well cast. Um, Diane Lane as Mark Kent. Um, I forgot his name. You said it loads of times just now. Kevin Costner as Park Kent and Jor-El, who was basically going gladiator style. He was just doing Maximus as Jor-El, which was bloody brilliant. The died whole the cast. Way. Say that again? He died the same way as well. He died the same way, you know. 
I there think was that's why he basically was gone. <laughs> it was it was Maximus. It was Maximus. Um, no, it was brilliant, and they finally got it right. I loved it. It was pure action. I was saying to Dan ages ago that films should take from the Avengers and have more action in them than just a quick wrap up. And with this, not only did they take that, but it was kind of like they took um, the criticisms from Superman Returns seven years ago, where everyone slated it because it was one good Superman moment of him, of him catching a plane and no action, and just went, here's your action, and here's more, and here's more, and here's more. And each time the stakes got bigger, uh, you know, more danger, more impressiveness, and it was just so good. The blade destruction of it all, the mass of it, it really took that whole action comics feel and was like, there it is, there's action comics on the screen, this is action movie, this is how it's done. Henry Cavill was perfect. I can't wait for number two, where we, where we hopefully see him balance Clark and Superman in that sort of Christopher Reeves way of, like, disguise himself, slouch himself, and the double acting. Um, yeah, he's just, he was so subtle, but, like, he stood out in every scene. Um, I've kind of got a man crush on him, and his uh, lovely face and teeth and hair. Um, really powerful, really good, great ending. I love the ending. I'm so glad they did it, because if someone's going batshit crazy like that, you're going to just do it. You're just going to... Snap his neck. I always said Batman should have known to Joker ages ago. People should do it more often. And just done. Um, loved it. But yeah, more blown away now. Nev's liking it, don't I? I'm the actual movie. Um, Fee, do you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, I'm, I've, I've got more sort of complex feelings about, about it. I didn't love it, but I certainly didn't hate it. Um, I, I don't think it was a perfect, movie by any stretch of the imagination uh, but neither do I think it sort of deserves a lot of the criticism that's being levied at it either um, so I thought it was visually stunning um, I, I thought the effects were absolutely fantastic and I thought it was really well directed and everything about it was kind of quite beautiful to watch including pretty much the whole cast um, I think along with the rest of the world, I'm in love with Henry Cavill now. Who isn't? I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, and I think even the boys do, don't you, boys? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 The bit where he had the beard. Actually, the girl that I went to see it with, who's a massive gay comics fan, right, pointed out that all the shots of him when he was running about with the beard are nicked from a comic called Tom of Finland, which I now am going to look up. Oh. Okay. So, but yeah, um, nice. He's um. Easy on the eyes, shall we say? But um, every, everyone was every, like, everyone was was nice to look at. Um, you know, even Russell Crowe was looking pretty hot. I thought. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, that, as there's so much I want to say about this, is trying to get it all straight in my head. Um, that one of my main problems with it was that there wasn't enough uh, Superman learning to be Superman. We sort of see a little bit of it. We see him when he's on the fishing boat and then he goes um, to rescue the guys on the oil rig. Um, and, you know, and that was great to see. But uh, there just wasn't enough of him learning to, to use his powers properly. We just sort of see him going from that part there in the beginning of the film, uh, going straight into being Superman. And then he learns how to fly. And then, like, oh, look, I've learned how to fly. Now I'm just going to go straight into the biggest fight of my life um, without really much training or anything. Uh, and it just sort of felt a little bit that that first sort of, uh, section of the film felt a little bit rushed to me it was like it was a bit of a rush to get him into the cape and get things moving I would have liked to have seen a little bit more um, of him learning you know to be Superman um, I thought what they did with the narrative was really interesting um, at the begin towards the beginning the first third of the film where you get flashbacks uh, with him going um, where you see uh, interactions with uh, Mar and Pa Kent um, and him growing up as a kid and stuff, and then uh, flash forward, you know, or coming into the present. I thought that was really, really well done. Um, Nev said about Kevin Costner being um, a really great Park Kent, and I've really got to agree. I thought he was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and yeah, I have to mention the scene, the cyclone scene, uh, or the oh, tornado yeah. scene. Um, and, uh, you know, I think anybody who wasn't sort of moved by that in the cinema must have been dead inside um it was really well done um and and you know really sad and i think you know you sort of start off watching that scene thinking well why isn't he going to help him um but that's all it makes it all the more poignant and kevin costner just gives a slight shake of his head as if to say no let me go uh you know i i 
you need to trust me because I trust you to do the right thing in the future. I thought that bit was fantastic. Um, the, I've been reading a lot of people saying, complaining about it being too sci-fi, you know, like it's more of a sort of like a sci-fi film than a Superman film. Um, I don't agree. I think, you know, Superman at the end of the day is an alien and, um, it, you know, I think sort of seeing the exploration of that uh, part of of his life and where he comes from and the impact that has on his time on earth is really important and it's not something that we've seen done before and in film um and i think it was i think it was a it was a good choice to make i liked it i loved all the action don't think that there was too much action i love seeing this match. it's great to see superman's real power um you know actually being shown sort of what he actually can do uh, i thought it was great um but um, the the and then we come on to a sort of what I think about him killing Zod. Well, you know what? I loved it. However, as somebody pointed out to me, I'm not sort of invested in Superman or other DC characters as much as I am in Marvel characters. And say, had this been Spidey doing that, I'd have gone nuts. Uh, <laughs> and it's and, and I would have, uh, and I would have hated it. But maybe because I'm not as invested in the characters as much, I don't know. Um, but I was glad that he did it. I liked to see it. I enjoyed seeing it. I thought it was really good. Um, but I do understand, you know, like what Sarah was saying at the beginning of the show, and I, I you know, I, I, I do get it. Um, but it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning though, about having complex feelings about the fit towards the film. I just don't think it was for, you know, it just nobody sort of straightforward I was, nobody's everybody's sort of like, like one end or the other you know like i've seen so many people saying they really hated it and so many people saying they really loved it um but i mean for me i'm quite sort of somewhere in the middle but um if my would my feelings be different if i was a massive dc fan probably but you know at the end of the day did i enjoy it yes was i riveted in my seat yes would i go and watch it again yes i would um, you know, and there will be a sequel, and I'm pretty glad about that. Um, and I can't wait to see it. See what you were saying about people not being that invested in it. Mm. Um, I went with uh, I went with my boyfriend and a few friends. Um, and all my friends who don't read comics regularly, or they like the idea of Superman, they all really really enjoyed it. It's only us who me and one of my friends and also my boyfriend who knows a bit about the comics and likes the characters, they hated it. Um, but for different reasons than me, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I do, I think, I do think that p- different people's relationships with the character has definitely influenced what they think about the movie. Um, there's been this week a lot of, um, I don't know if, if people out there have read it, but, um, Mark Wade has written, a, um, a review of what he thought about it and, um, he really, really disliked it, um, because he just thought that, uh, that moment with Zod, plus all of the big fights at the end, I didn't mention this, I think somebody else, I think Lucas might have mentioned this, about, uh, the, the huge destruction that happens towards the end of the how film. Many, I mean, how many skyscrapers went down because yeah. Superman punched Zod through one? Yeah, and then, you know, I, I was sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, there's no way they've evacuated the whole of Metropolis. There has to still be people in these buildings. So whilst this, like, massive smackdown is going on, people must be dying left, right and centre everywhere, you know. Um, uh, so that, that, that does sort of make you feel a little bit uncomfortable when you start thinking about that. And I think that was one of the main problems that Mark Wade and many others had with it was, was that sort of, you know, it, 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 all it needed was at one point for Superman to just step back and sort of save one person or see him saving like a few people, not just the people that he saves from Zod at the end, but, uh, you know, uh, a few more people here showing him having a bit more regard for human life than, than he actually does. And I, I do take that point on, on board because it definitely did cross my mind when I was watching it. OK, see, I can understand where people who aren't really familiar with Superman beyond the last five or ten years get off on the whole, like, well, Superman doesn't kill because he doesn't. But with Mark Wade, I don't get where he's coming from because he's got... The dude's like the Don of Superman information. And anyone who knows their onions about the Superman mythos will know that Superman regularly scared the crap out of people, like, for all through the 30s and the 40s. And it's been pretty well established via DC that he probably killed some Nazis during World War II and stuff. Clark has been known to kill... 
should the situation be absolutely unavoidable, right? In the situation in the movie, Zod is literally going to burn people to death with his heat vision. There's no way around that. There's nothing There is a way around it. it. They could have done anything to change that. So anyway, Clark's first mission is, this is the first time he's had to deal with anything on this scale. He doesn't know what he's doing. Zod is like a warrior who's been doing this for the good of Krypton and has gone crazy. He's like Kid Miracle Man into it. I mean, there should be more things said about the fact that all the bits where Zod finally like ex- throws away Kryptonian culture is a sheer rip of Kid Miracle Man sequence from Warrior and um, Marvel Man. But nonetheless, Clark does know what he's doing, and whether people know this or not, Clark has killed before, and young Clark has been really close to the edge. I know we all know him as like mature guy who now will do what will be the right thing in the given situation, but this is not the Clark Kent of now in the movie. This is the early days of Superman. And the problem is, as with a lot of my problem with fandom actually, is people are taking their preconceptions what a character ought to be and imposing them on the creative team behind the actual work. Zack Snyder and Christopher Nolan say Superman will kill in this situation. And that's really the end of the argument. Everything else is just opinions, and, you know, you can have all of them you want, but they're not. <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I, I, I don't I, agree, sorry. <laughs> but I, I do agree with what you're saying in, in, in that situation with regards to Zod, but going back to what I was saying before about the willful destruction of all of the buildings and all the, like, surely must be thousands and thousands of innocent people getting killed in in all of these skyscrapers because as I said there's no way Metropolis have been evacuated was there by by probably okay because Batman evacuated everybody beforehand I'm going to quickly chime in with this this kind of book indestructible right where the problem is if Clark stops beating on Zod for a second that's going to cost hundreds if not thousands of lives yeah, but why is he taking it elsewhere yeah that's, the, that's uh, Sarah that's the thing I think that's what I've just seen people yeah. say repeatedly like, you would have thought fight, he was like, to draw the fight away from the city the fight did go up into space for about a minute before they kind of went straight back down well, we should have stayed and brought a there. satellite with them into the I'm middle gonna, of the city I'm going to quickly chime in Zod is leading that fight Clark is reacting Zod is putting Clark in as much of a dangerous position as possible that's what I was about to say um, Clark is reacting and Zod is putting Clark in the shit. Either he stops the building falling over, or he stops Zod killing hundreds of people in the next few seconds. It's one or the other, and young Clark, who's never done this before, makes that snap decision. It's not a mistake, it's writing. Right, I'm going to quickly <laughs> chime in, right? An alien spaceship, we're all in the centre of London, alien spaceship decides to hover over London. What's the first thing all five of us do? Run! We're going to run away from the ship. I know you saw people still in Metropolis, but I took it that they were literally blocks and legging blocks it. and blocks away. They were halfway legging it. But obviously, when you're legging it and a Superman comes up to you, it doesn't look like you got very far away. So that, I took it that those built that main destruction that was all flat, that was the first to get cleared out. That's how I took it. And ad- also, ad- admittedly, yeah, there would have been people who would have made it out, but there are a lot of people in those buildings. I mean, it all looked great, and like Nevs was saying, Superman didn't really have much of a choice. If he'd flown away and said, Zod, come get me, Zod probably would have just destroyed another skyscraper. But- and here's another thing, real quick. I just read Birthright, and in Birthright, something happens kind of similar to this. And when finally confronting the big source of it all, Superman is there, and he even says um, like, why he's angry People have just died. He, he tells you how many have just died because of the main... I don't want to spoil it because I know some of you are probably going to be reading it this week. And Superman doesn't break down and go, oh, my God, I've, I've let these people die. He's like, you've let these people die. Now I'm going to kill you. Or not kill you. Now I'm going to stop you. That is it's unfortunate collateral damage. But as Lev said, you've got to get to the source of it. Otherwise, more will happen. And again, Superman was following uh, Zod. There was a lot of chasing. Zod was leading that fight. No matter how far away Superman would have gotten Zod, Zod would have gone back to Metropolis, gone back to the source to keep going. And as for the main kill, there was no second way around it. If I'm holding Lucas's neck and he's like, I'm going to fuck everyone up and your last plan to get rid of me just happened, but I wasn't part of it. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to burn you all. There's no way you can put me. I'm just going to have to put you down. 
Well, like, he's a farm boy. He's a farm boy. When an animal goes a bit mental or a bit sick, you've got to put it down. I think... Shoot horse in the mm, face. Well, um, one of my other issues with it, which only, only came up after the point where Superman then killed Zod, was that we hadn't seen a lot of his morality and how the Kents have brought him up to have him the strong morality that he's meant to have. Um, which wouldn't have been a problem if he found another way to deal with Zod. But I just think it's, it's, it's about, it's about the writing. The writers can do whatever they want. They could have, they could have found another way around it. And it makes it as, it makes it quite a cynical story. And it makes it, with the issues about Park and, and his fear of what Clark could do and what he couldn't do and what his place in the world was and whether he should let people know his powers. All of that combined with the fact that he got a lot of the teaching from um, from his Kryptonian parents. I just, it's not, I didn't come out of it with a good feeling at all. <laughs> I came out of it going, this, I feel a bit, I feel a bit deflated. I don't feel happy about this. And I just, it is a philosophical point on my half. I know it is. Um, because I am a massive Superman fan and it means a lot to me. So I'm well aware that I probably take it more personally than maybe other people. But it's, I don't think a Superman film should be cynical. I'm happy with a Batman film being cynical, but Superman's a very different character and he means different things. And he is, as they said, the symbol, if it means, for, if it stands for hope, I didn't get much hope from that. The bit at the end of it where he went on and he went back to the, he worked for the bit and that's, that I sat on, but it didn't really add to the main bit of the story. And that's where I think it failed. Um, I don't hold with the idea that it should stick to canon to the comics at all. Um, they can change that. I understand why they modernised everything um, with the relationship between Lois and Clark and all of that. I get that. That's fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Him only learning his powers as an adult, again, that's absolutely fine. Him finding Lois in the Fortress of Solitude in the Arctic, Antarctic, whichever pole it's on, again, that's absolutely fine. Um, they want to do that, no problem with that. But I just have a massive issue with it being made to be a cynical film. And I don't agree with what Neville was saying, that people who know the Superman history, you know, it's he's killed before. I know he's killed before, but that's not the point. <laughs> um, I don't so think he should have point? killed... I don't think in the first film, I don't I don't think it should have been like that. I'd understand it if it was maybe the second film or the third film, we'd see more of his character development. But we didn't see... We saw hardly any of his actual character development. We saw more about Lois and Perry who were great, they were really good. In fact, all the supporting cast was mostly, I think, really good. But I just don't think it should have happened in the first film. And even if Superman has killed before, that comes on the back of 70 years of comics history, and we don't have that in the film. And most people, I think, go to the film, they don't know the comics. I mean, most people are still saying, oh, you know, he's lost his, he's lost his red knickers. They're all devastated by that. They think it's ridiculous. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. You accept it or you don't. And actually, I think the costume looked really good. I really liked all the Kryptonian clothes. That was great. It was a brilliant um, sci-fi film. But um, I just don't, not good as a, I didn't like where it took us and the feeling and the message behind it. As you were saying that, Sarah, I don't mean to butt in. Um, but but in I, was, all you were fine. <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking that what we've got to take as well, we're just focused on a straight up neck break done. But you've also got to think that who, why he did it, it was to stop Zod. But it was to stop Zod for these people. It was, I'm, I will kill for you. You are, like, I, I looked at it like that as well, that he would kill for, for the human, human race. Yeah. Um, that's, to that's protect how, him. That's how I saw it. Which was mm. a bit more inspiring that, mm. like, not like Punisher style, uh, and that was nothing. It wasn't like Punisher style, God, I was straight up. <laughs> I was straight up have no remorse. He, he broke down afterwards. That's, you know, he fell to his knees and he yeah. just let out this, like, mm. um, humongous I think cry. Seen- more of that, but I think they'll probably go into that in the sequel, and I'm assuming there'll yeah. be a sequel. But for yeah. this film, as it stands, I don't think it was enough. But yes, he did break and down, we did see yeah. him, sorry, which is good. So there wasn't any like, right, that's it, I've killed him now, and anyone else who crosses the line, I'm going to kill you too. It was literally like, I didn't want to do that, and he begged him, he said, please, don't do this, and there was yeah. no stopping him. And that was fine, that's understandable. And also, I kind of see it as like a building, like, I know it was towards the end of the film, but it was still like they were still building him because they could carry it on and mention it in the second film that this is something he didn't want to do and he's mm-hmm. learned from that and he's not going to do it again because of how we felt. And maybe in the second film they could touch upon how other people, like the humans, reacted to seeing that, and maybe a bit of fear for them. And he's like, "I want, I'm not going to do it again. Yeah. I'm just here to help." And that was how I had to help you at that moment. Yeah, yeah what that's, was that's that's about it? 
was um when well, one of the good things was when he was fighting during the film. Then the army went, "No, mate, you're on our side. You're not on the side of the Gatonians." And the general dude, I don't know like his that. name was. I know it wasn't Sam Lane or it wasn't Lucy, and they really should have been name checked in it. But um, they said to his other soldier guys, "Like, no, don't shoot on him. He's our side." That that was really good. That was I like. Superman should inspire trust, and he this did. This man that, is not our enemy. It. Great, exactly. That was that was great. Um, but don't you think that the film should stand alone on its own merits, regardless of whether there's a sequel or not? Because that's a, I think that's a different issue. Yes, I know. Um, that was the thing that I really loved about it. Was unlike all of the Marvel movies, it felt like a, a film. It felt like a complete arc, okay. a, a story of a a boy becoming a Kryptonian and then eventually a man. And that's how, for me, movies work. They're complete stories yeah. in of themselves. Um, obviously, you don't need to know. I mean, yeah, knowing that Superman has actually killed before, it's not a great outrage. It's just a bit abhorrent in 2013. It's not a big deal. But the fact that you can just come into this and go, I know who all these characters are within 10 minutes of the film starting. I know what their motivations are. I know what the themes of the story are. And they're all resolved in a satisfactory fashion without going, oh, the big sequel enemy will be in the end <laughs> credit. Because that's not really fucking yeah. irritating at all. Thank you for that little trope, Marvel. Um, <laughs> it was just like, I don't have to sit through the end credits and wait for Thanos' big face to show up. Because the whole story is resolved at the end of that movie. And if anything happens in Man of Steel 2 or whatever it's going to be called, that's fine. And it will just build on what's happened before without being necessary to watch the first one much like the Batman movies did, which are also really good for being standalone stories, because that's how I think movies are meant to work, and movies are one thing, and TV shows are a different thing for a reason. See, you mentioned the Batman movies, and I was just going to say that I do think that it should stand on its own merit, but the one thing that makes me know and trust that there's going to be more of it in the sequels will be the fact that Christopher Nolan is on. You saw with the Batman movies, each film was like a standalone thing, but they were one big massive story of Bruce yeah. Wayne. So I have, I have the biggest faith and like feeling that one, two, and three, or four or five, how many ever there will be, will be standalone blocks, but one long Clark Kent Superman story. And at the end of all three, you'll probably be able to look at it and go, that's the Superman we know. Well, that's the one. As, as a lot of people should know that this is the start of like a, a DC shared universe. And Henry Cavill has been signed on for another two more movies. One is uh, a sequel to Superman. And uh, the third is going to be the uh, speculated Justice League movie. So you're definitely going to have a sequel, and you're going to have apparently shared universe. So Again, Nolan's on it. I have faith that Nolan's going to keep it tame. I don't think we're going to get... I don't think DC should be trying to make their films like Marvel, um, no. because they, they can't. Marvel had that zippy voice that DC doesn't really have. So what they should do is just... If I was DC slash Warner Bros., I'd say... Nolan, you you handle it, you do it, and he'll be like, yeah, I'll do it, don't worry, I'll handle it. And also I want to say, this did not feel like a Zack Snyder movie. And really? I actually liked What's it for it. Yeah. Done? Is it 300? Is that what 300, did? Sucker Punch, and Watchmen. And right, I've seen 300 and Watchmen, and I didn't like them. <laughs> and did you say Dawn of the Dead? Yeah, he did no. the remake, Dawn of the Dead, which right. was amazing. And I, I it was... It, it was classic, like, you know, Snyder, special effects heavy and really nice, but it just, I, I don't know if it was Nolan's producer, because I'm, I'm mentioning Nolan, Nolan a, lot, a lot, because I know that he wanted a lot to do with the film. He, it was this film he was actually aiming to direct, but there's only Warner Brothers going, we want you to do Dark Knight Rises, that he then got a producer's role. So maybe it is Nolan's guiding hand that made it not so flashy and, you know, a bit more... I don't know, there's something there that just didn't feel like Zack Snyder, but felt, it felt like it took what good Zack Snyder does, but added something better onto it. Oh, um, another, another thing I want to point out just about the movie, uh, who saw Lex Corp? I did. Yay! On the, on the truck. I saw that it on the nice. truck. Is, there was more? Yeah, was there, there was, a, there was some more, there was some more bits. Uh, I only saw the truck one, but, uh, people like there was the there. Lex Corp tower, and there was, a couple of LexCorp trucks, and there were a couple of Wayne Enterprises as well. I think the satellite was that there? came down at the end was apparently said Wayne Enterprises, which was like, oh, that's, that's really see, exciting. I, I didn't see any of that. I only saw the one truck, and that was it. But I'm, yeah, I'm so, um, guessing Lex will be in number two. Yeah, he'll probably be the main villain, harvest some Kryptonian atmosphere into a rock called Kryptonite. And, 
and then gets a super suit made from the remnants of General Zod's armor. Dun dun! And then fights Superman, and Superman beats him, and then doesn't kill him. And then, yeah, there we go. I and then Doomsday shows up. <laughs> yep. And then Crypto Dog, Super Dog saves Superman from Doomsday. And, and then, then Batman, the... and then, no, not Batman, Superman kisses Doomsday, and they all live happily ever after because Doomsday can't remember why he wanted to kill Superman. Yeah. <laughs> I did think watching from the Zod sequence though, like if you should have just kissed Zod. No, um. Anyway, I just thought if that's how well they can make a fight between Zod and Superman look, how epic is that Doomsday Superman fight gonna look? That thing's gonna look huge if they do that. I mean, yeah, we don't know. I mean, I I didn't even notice until the film was over. It's like, oh yeah, Lex Luthor's not even in this, and also like. Um, I think Sarah might have got the reference, but you guys might not have done, because I don't think you're quite so DC savvy, but I could be wrong, correct me if I am. Um, did you guys catch the reference to Emil Cadmus? Do you, like, do you know Cadmus. who he is? I didn't, I saw Norad, but... Emil Cadmus was the scientist who was, like, de- trying to de- reverse engineer the Kryptonian chamber, and he's got a whole world of his own in the Superman stuff. Like... There's a whole bunch of stuff that they've now established that can be touched upon. So yeah, they did such a good job of setting up future stories without going, this is what we're gonna do next. There's a lot of possibility there, and I just think that it will carry on and keep going and going and going yeah. until you what get a nice you... arc. Well, I just want to talk about the action scenes for a minute. Um, I thought they were a bit long-winded, but, and they could have done with a bit of editing, but I think you guys all Sort of liked it. Um, yeah. Pete, did you say that you liked it? Or the action and the effects. I mean, the effects were good, but what was your view on the whole continual 10 minutes, 20 minutes of fights? Or the, or the fight scenes. <clears throat> um, I loved it. I, 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 there's nothing I like more than a fight scene. So to have one go on for about 20 minutes nonstop was, uh, I was pretty all right with. Um, yeah, no, the, the, the person who I went to see it with, um, first thing they said when we came out of cinema was like, no, that was, there was too much fighting in that. Um, and mm. thought, therefore it went on for a bit too long. But, um, no, I had no problem with it. I just, I, you know, everything that happened was going towards the, um, you know, was going somewhere. I don't. I didn't feel like any of it was gratuitous or anything. Um, I don't know whether you did. You think that or I did that think you it didn't was like bit, it. I thought it was a bit long-winded and said so could have done with a bit of editing. But I found the start, the whole Krypton saga bit, explaining about that a bit long-winded as well. But it didn't really bother me. I'd have happily sat through it all had I liked the ending of the film. Um, and I was happy sitting through it all, but some people I was with thought it was long-winded. Others thought, "No, it's great." And I loved, well, I loved all the little effects with the punches. Just every punch had a shockwave sent outwards from it. That just kind of, just to show you how strong Superman's punch is. Yeah, that that's what I thought was done really well. I think I mentioned said that earlier on. I, I I really did think that all of the action sequences in the whole that last third part of the film did a really really good job of showing just how powerful Superman is or is meant to be. Um, and, you know, whilst other films have sort of like tried to do that, I think, I don't, I think this, this is certainly, was certainly more successful in doing that than other films that I've seen. I thought it was, it was done really, really well. Like, you know, is Superman actually using his power to his full capabilities? And like you said, it's just the way that it was directed and the use of the sound and the power and everything just really, really came across on screen. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. It really felt like these were gods just punching each other. The, the speakers in my cinema must have been turned full volume because each punch just had this massive boom. And the fight between Superman and Non, the big giant guy, I'm guessing it was Non. They change their names around. Well, yeah, because yeah, uh, F- Fiora, the female Kryptonian, she that, is that when she was fighting so. both of them? Yeah, that that fight was great. Yeah, that one, I loved it. I loved the whole sort of like choreo- choreography of it because it was it was like controlled chaos. There was like it was a big slugfest, but there was like it was like almost like a the dance. military were dicks. You know, they didn't know what to do. They, they could clearly the... see Superman trying to fight it. Yeah, let's just uh, let's just mini gun a whole street. That's just you know? that's just like. Touching on like the not trusting him thing, you know, like they've never seen him before. And... They don't know what's going yeah. on. That's that's fine. They would try and shoot on them all because they don't know what's going on. That's not a problem, I don't think. But I just loved it, like um, the bit where Superman goes to jump away 
and then Non grabs his cape and throws him. You like using it like Superman, just so like clunky and not used to it, and this is something new to him that he's his own costume is getting him beaten up, and that he just doesn't know what they're doing. Avengers, see, with um, the Avengers, puny god. That was that was oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where Hulk bashes his own floor. That is actually a good point. Don't wear capes, anyone. Listen to The Incredibles. Loki got beaten up. But they look Super so got beaten lovely. Up. <laughs> they look nice, but they will get you beaten up by giant people. You need like a prehensile cloak with like a muck cape with a mind of its own that can fight back for you. <laughs> or you need to be four and just be like, I don't care Badass. about the cape because I've got a massive hammer. And um, pop, which helps. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to, but the action scenes, as I said earlier, I felt that each time there was a big sequence, the, the, um, stakes got higher. So the, from the first one with the oil tanker, you know, the stake there was just the helicopter will get hit. He needs to get him clear. And then it kept going up that if he doesn't stop this one with non and I'm going to call her Ursa because I know her as Ursa, but she's something else in this. Bayora. Bayora. Oh. She's a beautiful lady, but I just want to call her Ursa so bad. Um, so I've, got, I've got a fact about Ursa. Do you want to hear it. it? My my boyfriend's auntie's cousin played her in the in the Reeve films. It's an interesting ah, fact. You're, for you're related to her. Cut, sort of. Um, 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 right, okay. You make um, you make him your husband. I'm very excited. Yeah. So you're like what one fifth Kryptonian? Yeah, sort of. Can you that get explains so much. <laughs> right, someone get the military on. Right, we can't trust her until I'm, she shows us yeah. that she can fight bad guys. Oh, guys, I, I have a question about the movie, actually, because I was pretty much... You know what I'm like when I'm watching a movie, right? You guys will follow me on Twitter, and if I start getting bored, I start tweeting and smoking and taking the mickey. And obviously, all throughout this movie, I was just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I pretty much shut up except to go, that dog's so cute. Did I'm anybody- right if the name of the dog was Crypto or not? No, it wasn't Crypto and it wasn't Shelby either. I don't know what they named it, but it wasn't what it should have been in my fangirl-like continuity. I had thought that was going to call... There was two you dogs, weren't there? It's comics. Say it again? I said, do any of you guys like cry at Elseworlds comics? Because there seems to be a real problem no. with continuity. No, uh, Elseworlds comics, I've never cried, I don't think, at uh, Elseworlds comic. But knowing that you have nerves... I have makes indeed, yeah. Feel, makes me feel sad. The one where Superman's like the last guy on Earth and has to populate all the women. That's a real heartbreaker. I'm not even making that one up either. Um, <laughs> I got... You're making that up. I will send you the link right now, Sarah. Right Excellent. now. Okay, I well, uh, let, let's move on. Let's Thanks, move sir. on into, um, how, how would, how would you guys like to see this all like tie into like a future Justice League universe? I want a Wonder Woman film. <laughs> Wonder Woman! It feels like if they're gonna do it, they're going to have to do it, as I said earlier, with like a Nolan vision, because this and Batman yeah. Begins, uh, Batman the trilogy, sorry, were, they've all got the same feel. So if this is going to be the first link into Justice League and it's got the feel of the Dark Knight trilogy, then you might as well just carry that all on yeah. and have a Nolan Wonder Woman and a Nolan yeah. Flash. And okay, there's a slight up. problem with that, though. In that They're all Christian- going to be dark. No, Christian Bale has pretty much said that he doesn't want to play Batman again. So what's going to happen? Are you going to recast it? Are they going to reboot it again? Well, here's the thing. They did say that if when they do Batman, it will be Bruce Wayne and it will be a younger Bruce Wayne, I think is what they said, if they do go ahead with it. Um, And whatever Bruce Wayne you, apparently, whatever Batman you get in the Justice League, if reactions are good to it, that's when you'll get it in, that Batman you'll get in the single films. So, um, I'm guessing there won't be any, uh, uh, Christian Bale, but it will be a, a non-Christian Bale Batman in the tone of Noland. I'm okay. guessing, I don't know. That's what I so think. So long as it's be. not another origin movie, that's fine, because I am getting a bit tired of origin movies, but it could work. It'll be good. If I want the whole it, universe of DC. I'm jealous of all you Marvel guys with your films and you can see it all alive and I haven't had any. See, this, the whole movie verse of DC is going to start being tied closer to the New 52. DC came out ages ago and saying that their other media stuff will all be in some way mirroring the New 52. We saw it with yeah, Superman really- and his costume, and we'll see it in Batman, and I don't know what, because Batman's unchanged, but we'll see the New 52 reflecting that. So when it does come to the Justice League, 
I'm guessing the first film will be Cyborg as the eyes of the audience, Dark Side as the big bad, and go from there. That's so, all I can see. So will it be Barry as the Flash then, I'm assuming, as he's really the only Flash? Because I don't think they count Jay. Yeah, I think, I think so. That's a shame, because I like Wally, but... You as well. There is yeah, no Wally. There is no Wally anymore. I am gutted we've lost Wally. Utterly, unless utterly gutted. He's, unless he's the new reverse Flash. I don't know. He's not going to be a bad guy. He's going to be a good guy. <laughs> you don't know this. Think about I, it. The, the original verse Flash was kind of a good guy being bad, weren't he? He was like trying to be the bad guy, the best bad guy, so the Flash would be the best Flash. If you keep going like this, I'm going to cry. <laughs> I want Wally to be a good guy. No I, gingers I are good. Say, I, I try not to be the throwing the toys out of the pram guy when it comes to mucking about with major characters, because, you know, obviously it's not my characters and my opinion doesn't count, but... Throwing away all the awesome stuff that Mark Way did with Wally West on his run of Flash, just so like we could have Barry West, Barry Allen back for no real reason, was one of the saddest things that came out of like the yeah. new editorial regime of DC. It was like there's no reason to bring Barry back, and if you go back and read the original Barry comics, he's not a very interesting character. You know what I mean? It's it not like... dull. <laughs> it's really boring. It's a... But ginger people can't be superheroes, and that's coming from someone that is ginger. I, um... Missed it! <laughs> She's ginger, isn't she, or is she brown? Jimmy so They all get killed off in the end. They all get killed off or uh, have a, an annoying buzzing watch. What about, um, I know he's not DC, but, um, hello, Matt Murdock. Oh, yeah. Fair point, and by the Think that just shot your theory down in flames, Bertie. Yeah, hang on a minute. Hang on. Was there not a period where Daredevil turned bad and Guy oh, Gardner's going to join the Red wait, Lanterns? Wait. Boosh, boosh, boosh. In your no, faces. Guy Gardner's a strong kid. That's why we like him. In your faces. Lex Luthor was ginger. Oh, in your faces. Lex Luthor was never a superhero. Boom. That's what I'm saying. They can't be superheroes. He could have been the best superhero oh, ever, but they, he's mental. He's mental in the face. Look he's at the ginger, ginger man. He pervs on women in the showers. What? <laughs> Listen, right? I am, I am all authority to say this. Authorized by who? Me, Mister. Me, I authorized him. Okay. Dude, you black can't black authorize black. nothing against gingers. You've got like the darkest, blackest hair in the world. Either way, other than uh, this talk Crazy. about gingers and hair. Okay, right. So Let, let's move on. To, yeah, let's uh, move on. We've started. Let's move on to something. Bad. Not necessarily super related, and this week's comics. So, what have we been reading? Sarah, would you like to take it away? Yeah, um, I only got two this week. I expect about six, but I got my weeks mixed up. So I got Full God of Thunder, which is, well, if you guys have been reading it, it's got absolutely gorgeous art. Yep. It's a good story because you've got three Thors, and the Space Shark made another appearance, which God, I like. Green Space Shark. Yeah, yeah, there was nobody hitting anybody else in the face with it, which was a shame, but Space Shark, so that was good. And um, I also got Superman Unchained, which was all right, but has this ridiculous fold-out thing, which was just stupid. I felt like I was a 12-year-old buying Smash Hits. Um, but the, I suppose the comic was all right, and the whole. Um, it's probably enjoyed it more than I enjoyed the film, but... Um, yeah, it wasn't a not a big week for me. I've got um, about eight to pick up next week though, so that's better. I'll let you guys talk about your stuff now. Um, all right, Lucas, what about you? Because this was uh, a big week for you, right? This was the start of what you've been no, waiting this was for. The, this was the start of uh, Batman Year Zero. But I'll start with Thanos Rising issue three first, uh, which is kind of uh, to those of you who don't know, kind of uh, Thanos' uh, previous life before being the Avatar of Death. And um, I was a bit weirded out because um, Thanos is trying to figure figure out who he is. He's killed a bunch of people on his home planet, and he's left. He, he's gone. He's gone to search to, like just new things. So uh, he he meets a uh, he meets a lady, uh, well an alien lady, and has a kid with her. Then leaves to become a pirate, but refuses to kill anybody while they're pillaging ships, which is all very very anti Thanos. And it turns out that Thanos has had a bunch of children, like about like loads of children all across the galaxy. And I'm like, wait, wait, what is this? Thanos is like a, a space man whore? And, um, yeah, uh, at the end of it, he meets what I'm going to assume is death in weird girl-child form. 
and uh, she convinces him to go back and kill all of the children he's just had and their their mothers. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, it's still Thanos, it's still Thanos. So, other than that, I was uh, reasonably uh, impressed with it. Maybe a bit morbid, the amount of uh, kids he, he went back and killed, but... Right, hey, let me get this straight quick. Normal person's reaction to a man killing all his kids. Oh my god, monster! Lucas's one. Oh, okay, that's Thanos. Yeah, no, it's... it's it's not. Re- I mean, I understand that you know it's graphic and kids shouldn't read that comic, if, especially if you're afraid of big purple aliens with giant chins. <laughs> but it's a fear plagued by me. It, it, it is. It is. You know, a comic. So th- those kids that uh, that Thanos went back and killed, and you never actually saw him actually kill any of them. It was just kind of like all off panel. So yeah, it was dark. Yeah, it was dark, but it was it was good dark. Is it get, is this miniseries getting you more excited for the Infinity event? I'm not gonna tell you how excited I am, because, uh, cause, cause I'm not. But Thanks, I, I, am, I, I am, yeah. I am quite, no, I'm really, really looking forward to it. So, especially after all the other stuff I've read, so, uh, fingers crossed it's gonna be good. But okay. next up, uh, my favourite thing that I've read, which was, uh, Batman, uh, Zero Year. Whoop whoop. Whoop whoop. Wasn't that? I, I really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was great, especially after just, like, the last two kind of slightly underwhelming issues. This is mm. fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the really, art, really Kapoor's good. art is... I think uh, this new inker is doing wonders for him because the lines look cleaner. It looks a bit uh, brighter in colour as well. It just looks a bit more poppy than the scratchy dark that came before. Yeah. But, um, once again, uh, Batman Year Zero is the start of this whole what Batman did during the... Uh, the year he was back in Gotham but wasn't Batman. So, just kind of like a, a precursor to Batman Year One. But it shows you this little, like, flashback from about five years, I think five years prior from Batman being Batman. Yeah. Where you see, like, Gotham in complete ruins. There's, like, the subways are all flooded. There's these weird guys with masks going around. And Batman shows up on a motorbike with, like, a bunch of stuff. So... No idea what's going on there, but it's definitely got me hooked. Yeah, I love that whole thing. It kind of, it was weird, because it was reminding me of The Wake. Do you know how it opens up into this Yeah, weird no, really kind of like, you're not sure what's going on. Post-apocalyptic, flooded, barren yeah, place. Yeah, it's just kind of like pieces all being moved into place. Yeah, the best yeah. way to describe um, Gotham, how it looks five years in the past, is We Are Legends slash The Last of Us. Overgrown city, shattered, yeah. broken, crumbling away. And Batman on a dirt bike. Yeah, but other than that, I thought it was really good. Can't wait for next month's issue. Looking yep. forward to next issue of uh, Phantom Infinity, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna read Guardians of the Galaxy uh, <laughs> sometime, so I can uh, start talking about raccoons and trees. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, you know, I like raccoons cool. and trees, everyone. But yeah. somebody else's comics time. Who wants to go? Nevs, Fee, or Bert? Fee, you go. Ba 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 bum. Fee. Um. So my favourite thing that I've read this week was um, Savage Wolverine by um, Zeb Wells. Um, uh, Zeb Wells is one of my favourite uh, writers. Actually, I don't see um, you don't, he's not doing too much around, around the Marvel universe at the moment. So I was kind of quite pleased to see him. Um, I started with Savage Wolverine when Frank Cho was doing his arc and dropped it after the first issue because I just wasn't feeding it. Um, and then speaking to other people who carried on reading it, I'm glad I did drop it because uh, apparently it didn't get any better. Um, but um, this is um, going to... Zeb, Zeb Wells is doing like a short arc. I'm not sure if it's two issues or, or three uh, before Jock comes uh, um, on board and does the does an arc where he's that he's actually drawing and writing, um, which I'm going to be interested to see that. So I'll pick that up as well. Um, lots of people getting very very confused about this issue of Savage Wolverine, which is number six by the way, uh, because um, it's very confusing about where it stands in the con- in terms of continuity. Uh, there's a little um, sort of caption on the um, on the um, a recap page, a little editor's note that says that this story takes place a while back, like at least before October, so don't get all out of sorts about continuity. But I think <laughs> even still, sort of, even if you have that thought in your mind, it doesn't really make much sense. So I think the best way to approach it is to just say that it's completely out of continuity. 
Um, but the best thing about the issue, the best thing about the issue is that Pete is in it. My PT, Pete is Spidey. So, um, I just couldn't be happier really. Uh, it's just so nice to see him. Um, and that he's interacting with Logan as well. Cause I love, love, love seeing them two together. Um, and Zeb Wells wrote one of my favorite issues of, of Spider-Man ever, which was, um, uh, um, which took place, uh, had an interaction where it was Wolverine's birthday. I think I've spoken about it on the show before. Um, where uh, they uh, Wolverine takes um, Pete to a pub and they go and have a drink and get in a bit of trouble. Um, and I absolutely love that. And yeah, Zeb Wells wrote it. So uh, I really do like him see, uh, seeing him write these two characters interacting with each other. Um, lots of humour. It's very funny. Um, and Electra is in this issue as well. Um, mm. And then the other thing why everyone's getting really confused is because um, if anybody's been reading Daredevil, um, the... Uh, oh spoilers but um, the, um, we sort of find out um, that Bullseye isn't maybe quite as dead as we thought recently in Daredevil um, and um, this issue sort of focuses on, on um, Bullseye as well um, so it doesn't actually fit with what's going on in, in with, with Daredevil at the moment uh, but I really loved it and I can't wait for the next one it was a really really good story I know Ned you read this as well didn't you I did. Um, I, I mean, you know me and my approach to continuity. I couldn't give a monkey's about it as long as the comics one. Um, so I was kind of, I was a bit like, oh, is that Pete being Spider-Man playing with swords? Uh, yeah, all right, cool. Then on we go. Um, I thought Joe Mad's artwork was spectacular. I remember just seeing the disappointment when he was drawing the Ultimates, and I was like, wow, maybe he's just lost it. But no, give him a script that he cares about that isn't about weird incest and stuff, and he obviously knocks it out of the park. Um, but I thought the best thing in the whole issue was Pete desperately cracking onto Electra and Electra just not even bothering to respond to him. Um, <laughs> pretty funny. And that was pretty funny. Um, I'm assuming it's somewhere in continuity because it doesn't have the kingpin as like, you know, the king of New York. Um, so that's all happened quite late into Bendis' Daredevil run. So it obviously fits somewhere. It was kind of weird seeing Hawkeye in his old costume or his lame costume as I like to call it. But yeah, a really fun issue, and I was really dreading it just because it was the issue after a Frank Cho comic, which is kind of like Eric Larson following Tom McFarlane, yeah? But no, really good fun, really enjoyed it. Best is Wolverine this, comic on the stands for my, like, by miles. Is this um, like Wolverine's team-up book, The Savage Wolverine, or is it like, what is the actual... Because I know you've got Avenging Spider-Man, Superior Spider-Man, with this you've got Savage Wolverine, Wolverine, and it seems like... So, He's teaming up with everyone. It strikes me that what it probably is is the Wolverine equivalent of Legends of the Dark Knight, where you just go, okay, there's probably some continuity somewhere, but you just kind of throw it out the window and you say, right. hello, awesome artist and artist, right, awesome writer, would you like to write a thing about a character? Then go okay. wild. I mean, Old Man Logan, would, which is, for my money, the best Wolverine story ever, would have fit quite happily in this rather than its actual own title. But yeah, it's much more fun than the Paul Cornell thing, which isn't bad, but just a bit like, oh, it's all serious and very serious comics and it's all real and grim and blur. Should I talk about my comics now? Go for it. Yeah. Okay, well, I read Superman, Superman Unchained and um, two questions sprang to mind. One, why is this an issue one of a new comic being released the same week as the movie? Right. Why, why not just... Sorry? Promo. <laughs> I want to get more well, sales. Yeah, it was it's just like, considering how abysmally bad the other Superman comics have been since the New 52 kicked off, yeah. why not bring this degree of creative talent to one of the Superman comics that is currently sucking the monkeys out? And that raised the second question. Given how good Jim Lee has been on occasion when he drew his things like Flinch or that short story he did with Neil Gaiman with the, for the comic book Legal Defense Fund comic, why does he keep resorting to this, like, really... It's, I mean, it's bad Jim Lee, Jim Lee. I'm not the guy's biggest fan of the best of times unless he's trying, but this was really just poor Jim Lee artwork, and that quadruple page spread thing didn't help <laughs> anything. It was like, I, I don't want to, like, turn my comic into a map. 
Do you know what I mean? It's not cartology. It's just reading a funny book and trying to read this thing on the bus, but then you're holding it at funny angles and you're like, this now looks like I'm reading really bizarre spandex yeah. porn. I can't be bothered doing that for a fucking Superman comic. Um, and the really annoying thing is, as like um, Lucas said, it was released the same week, same week as Batman Zero Year. And talk about your ends of the spectrum, man. Because this was just like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, interesting twist. And then Batman Zero Year was fantastic. Um, just like such a good story. And I was so cynical about this. Because if there's one character whose origins we all know really well, it's frigging Batman, right? But it actually brought a new element to it. And a new like way of looking at things for Batman. I'm totally intrigued. And the only thing that really got me wondering was the fact that Bruce's uncle is called Kane. As in... Bob Capri Kane. Kane. As in the guy who co-created Batman with Bill Finger in the first place. And there's a really telling panel where, like, Alfred's trying to kick the dude out, and the, the um, speech balloon reads, you have no business here, Mr. Kane. I'm like, hang on. Hang on. So that, that doesn't happen by accident. Scott Snyder knows what he's talking about, and you don't just randomly call a character called Kane in a Batman comic. You know, like, we're in an era where things are called Sprang Avenue and Robinson Drive and stuff. This is not a mistake, and it was really odd, and I was hoping there was more to it than that. I actually thought it was a relation to the Batwoman, uh, Kate Kane, the red-haired Batwoman. Then that's going to lead to all kinds of weird incestuous problems down the line. Yep. Um, what else? Oh, True Tales of the Fabulous Killjoys. How did we not mention that with our beloved Becky knocking out a new comic this week? Because I forgot it was out and I never picked it up. It was a rhetorical question, but never mind. Um, I, I love you, know. you Bert. <laughs> I love you, Sue. It was awesome. You know, it's as good as the preview and more so. It, if, if you're left with two things from what I've been ranting about on this show... One, go and watch Man of Steel. Two, go and buy True Tales of the Fabulous Killjoys. We love you, Becky. Um, I like Jared Way, which is not a f- sentence I'd ever thought I'd say in my life, but the dude's such a good comics writer. It's just there. So I think that's my comics of the week. Okay, my, my comics of the week are a bit like rehashing. Uh, Four God of Thunder, really bloody good. I thought yeah. this was actually the end issue. I thought the, the bit at the end where they all three fours teamed up against Gore, pushed him into the sun hammering the crap out of him and then all of a sudden the last page of real spoilers is Gore standing over the bodies of the three fours the old four the current four and the young four just be like yep yeah, that's me I'm the boss and then he carries on I'm an old not. I really liked it as well I was kind of like oh my god this ride just won't stop it's also brings epic, me isn't it? <laughs> really 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 like proper epic there's a bit where like current four punches him like light years away and, and just in a flash he's there he's landed on a moon and then they break the moon a bit and it just yeah. harder and harder there's a description that I loved of Curran Ford just swinging a hammer and each time he swings he swings harder and harder but his muscles tear his bones crack and his body aches but he just keeps going really brutal Jason Aaron's got such a good voice for four and Isard Ribic is just a monster on this art the expressions the power really bloody brilliant that um, slash page about four was it four pages in uh, the big, uh, which which one? I need big to go get my double page spread where they're um, they're all three swords are jumping towards Gore's black. They're jumping off the boat. Yeah, that yes. was amazing. I got that. I was like, oh, was not expecting that. That was absolutely lovely. <laughs> really, really brilliant. I love it. I'm looking at it right now with the attack yeah. dogs coming up and the young four light is at front and center and just going down. He's really brave, brave, bloody, bloody, well, bloody brilliant. Just for that. Yeah. And it makes me think, Marvel seems to be doing a lot of time travel stories. This is messing around with time travel. Um, Age of Ultron's got big time travel stuff. And there was another one in my head, but it's gone. I could be wrong. But it just seems that there's a weird link between this and time Oh, uh, X-Men, that was it. All new X-Men is a lot of time traveling. And I'm thinking maybe, maybe there could be something down the line. You know, just it just seems a bit of a coincidence that three big books are using time travel in a way. And then you've got Tony Stark in one of the main events talking about time travel as in an organism not to be used too much. Um, anyway, bloody brilliant. Go pick it up if you're not reading it. I'm trying, I'm trying to get Lucas and Fee onto this. I know they're not massive four fans. Um, but really, really worth to read. I read 
Batman year, uh, zero year. All I'm going to say on that is I'm sold because of Riddler story. Riddler is the boss. Um, loved Riddler. And Unchained was all right. It was, I've been reading a lot of Superman. As I said before the podcast, I said to these guys, I've been reading a lot of Superman this, this week. Rereading All Star and Birthright and compared, it wasn't, it just didn't stand up. If I didn't read those two, I probably would have read it and just gone, oh, that's all right. It's a bit interesting. But it wasn't, it just couldn't stand up to what is known as the big, big, massive good stories. Um, and I, that was, that's me. I'm, I'm read them. I can't believe that I couldn't pick up Killjoys this week. Just didn't get a chance. I was going to go on not thinking properly. The Dark Horse hasn't got a comics, a comicsology account. So I now have to go through different sources, but I will be getting Killjoys. And, you know, cause it's two great tastes put together to taste even greater. Um, yeah, that's me. Go read four. Four's wicked. Love yeah. four so good. It is bad. Yeah. All right then. Well, uh, after that, it's time for mystery comics. So the mystery comics uh, for this week they were five weapons, fight five, five weapons. weapons. Okay, five weapons, clone. suicide risk, and clone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Who wants to start it? Nevs, why don't you start them up? All right, I'll kick off with clone because I've read it in the last hour or so. Uh, well, reread it to make sure I knew what it was on about. Um, it's uh, David Schwimmer's first comic, or David Schumer, I might have mispronounced that, with um, Juan Jose Rip, or Rep, and it's the story of a man who appears to be fighting several clones of himself. And I tell you what, Image are getting really good at knocking out these first issues of stuff with intriguing um, concepts and ideas. It was really a case of not expecting anything and actually getting something quite amazing. I know Juan's been doing a lot of work in comics and it's only the last couple of years or so that people have started recognising him and going, actually, this guy's really good at drawing. Uh, very intense comic, a uh, very scary prospect where there's a bit where his wife is in the hospital and his clone comes to kidnap her and mm-hmm. pretty grisly stuff going on there. But what really struck me is literally this guy's David's first ever comic. And, you know, he's done a better job than a lot of the stuff that's been done by guys who've been around for a long, very long time. So I really liked it. And it was one of those rare occasions where I'm like, actually, let's just see what happens in issue two. So, yeah, liked it lots. Guys, what did you reckon? Um, yeah, I really liked Clone. Um, in fact, I liked it so much, I've, I've, I've gone ahead and read the in, um, every issue up till now. Um, like you said, like, this is the first comic that um, that he's written but um he's um he writes for TV um oh. and I think and I think you can really tell uh, I think it's um it's really well paced uh, it's really well put together and actually each issue does actually read like a you know like a short uh television episode I think it's really well done um it's uh really intriguing the first issue is really great so it's a really really interesting story um uh which leads into uh you know sort of like a, a real build up between all the different characters so you see the uh luke is the the main clone that we sort of meet um and him and his wife um and then uh we soon find out like quite that there are you know there are other other clones um and um as the series goes on we get to meet more of them and find a little bit more about what's going on um and as i was reading it before i actually found out that the the writer actually writes for television i was actually thinking like this will would make a brilliant tv series um i don't know if anybody else thought that at all um yeah i was gonna say it didn't occur to me it'd make a good tv series (coughs) very good at picking up what translates well to different media um I mean, I started reading the comic, the first couple of pages, I was like, oh, well, I'm not massively, not massively interested. By the end of that, by the end of the first one, I was actually really quite intrigued. I don't know if I'm intrigued enough or just enough to pick up the rest of the series, but I thought it was, it was well done. Um, it was, yeah, it was interesting. It was, and um, yeah, I have not mixed feelings. I think it's more that it takes a lot for me to pick up stuff as an ongoing. Um, but yeah, it was, but certainly not better than I expected at the start. I enjoyed it. I could see it as a TV show. I'd actually look quite like seeing it as a TV show. The way it jumps between Luke and what he's doing and the president and it's got that tension build that builds in the TV pace. Um, loved the art in it. Very like a realistic kind of art. It reminds me of someone really bad. I can't, I don't, I just, 
I don't know who. I'll come across it eventually. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably do what Fee did and read the rest of the series. Uh, I think this this batch of mystery comics in general, I think I've really enjoyed. I'm going to carry on with, but Clone, as as Nev said, Image, just know what they're doing at the minute. They just going for it, pushing things, to, just the weird ideas and concepts. Um, and I kind of instantly fell for like the, the characters. I want this Luke to be all right, and I want his wife to be all right, and I want him to be safe at the end of it. You know, don't care about anyone else. Just make sure Luke, Luke and that baby's fine. Which might not even happen. You read, like, it does, like, from what I've read, you don't know what's gonna happen next. Um, uh, Lucas, you there? You read it? Yeah, I read it. Um, I'm gonna echo Sarah here. Uh, it was interesting, and it, and it was, it was well done, it was, you know, a nice read. However, I couldn't see myself becoming really invested in it. But I'm intrigued, but not like super duper intrigued. That's uh, that that's my general my general thing. Yeah. Thanks for that, Lucas. Man, yep, you I know. Really I, touched I, upon my insight stuff there. Is, I just wasn't really that like like I said. I was that's interested, enough, but man. not interested in it. I really like Suicide Risk. So uh, well, can we talk right. about that? Yeah, go on. You start off as a Suicide Risk. Suicide Risk, I thought was fantastic. Kind of like the story of a. Uh, a police officer kind of uh, on the front lines in the in the war between uh you know super criminals and uh what looks like a very small amount of superheroes first of all i just want to get like my my main negative they have all got stupid names like so, some hero drops down called extended remix yeah man and i'm like wait what, what, what i wonder i wonder what his power oh oh he's dead yeah but um maybe he's yeah. got some weird music related dubstep power yeah he can uh, he can dubstep here which is absolutely, yeah, great. Well, well, but no, well. no, really, really enjoyed Suicide Risk. Just, I don't, mm. I can't even remember the main character's name. That's how, that's how much I loved it. But can't, you know, unfortunately, I can't remember his name either. But um, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna try and help. I you. felt like really sorry for him. Like his his mate lost an arm, and he sees this like on a daily basis, and you know, he never knows what's gonna happen. Kind of next time he goes out. It's just, it does. It set up a, a scary world where it was. It was touching upon like um, everyone that gets people buy these powers, and it seems that a majority of the people that buy the powers either instantly go evil or over time become evil. And it's not a safe world. There isn't loads of superheroes around. It's more villains than there are heroes. The police are getting the kick shit shit kicked out of them. As as Luke said, like man gets arm ripped off. Hundreds of them, not hundreds, but a big number of them got killed within the opening of the book. Um, yeah, it was a really good setup, and I'm just gonna quickly hit the premise of it. So the premise is this man is, he's being interviewed, um, and it's a flashback to what happens. There's a bank job with these villains, they killed loads of policemen, they hurt his, uh, mate, rip his arm off. He survives, he gets lucky and survives, but after it, he's really taken a bad effect on him, and he somehow gets a number of supplies of powers, and he get, and, he gets a number, has a meet up with his people. The people do some tests on him with this little glowy ball. The tests go off the roof, like you know, he's a, he can have the powers and it's like off the charts, like available to him. He gets the powers. A burst of lightning happens. He falls to the ground, and police show up, thinking these people have killed him. And that's where that the issue that I've read. I'm not sure if anyone's carried on or if the second one's even out yet. Um, that's where we've ended it. And I'm going to say I really loved it. Oh, it's from Boom Studios. Um, I really can't remember the creative team at the minute. Really, really brilliant. I love, I do love the real world superhero types. So like Bounce, uh, early in the week was a similar feel to it. You're like just a normal guy getting powers. But this was just well done. Uh, booms on fire, like images. Gotta carry on with it. What do you guys think? I think I just rambled for a second there. Um, I didn't, I didn't really care for it that much. It didn't really do a lot for me. And it might be, is having a earlier on, it seems a bit, it just, it just felt a bit depressing, the whole thing, and I don't usually like any sort of media stories like that, but it was an alright read, I have no interest in reading any more of it. <laughs> Anyone else? Fair enough. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be the, the person who actually really liked it, I have to say, uh, it's Mike Carey writing it, if you guys were wondering, um, previously of various X-Men comics, Hellblazer, the Unwritten, uh, Lucifer, 
comics. So Nan's obviously got a fine pedigree in quality comics. Uh, the art, for me, was actually the star of the show. It's by a lass called Elena Casagranda, which I might be mispronouncing, but I think she's spectacularly talented. She's like this really strong mix of Chris Browse and Terry Dodson, so I thought she did a really good job there. Um, I really liked it because I like crime stories, and it, for me it was like a really nice mix of NYPD Blue crossed with Astro City. And I liked things that deal with what the fallout would be of having these untrained nutjobs running around in spandex, you know? So yeah, for me, I don't want to dwell too much because I know we've got a lot to get through, but yeah, totally enjoyed it. Great stuff. Okay, um, and our last book, it was another image book, it was Five Weapons. Um, I've only read the first three issues. Um, Fee, do you want to start us off on Five Weapons? Um, yeah, this, this was, um, this isn't, wasn't a book for me. Um, I, I, I can see, uh, why, you know, other people would like this. This just wasn't for me. Um, so this is a, um, uh, a school for assassins where um, these kids go to this school and go and choose a um, a group to belong to and then train to be an assassin. Um, generally speaking, I don't like precocious kids. So and this comic is full of precocious kids. So uh, if that's not your thing, then like me, then sort of stay away. Um, having said that, it is really well written and it's well done. And there's some really nice moments in there in terms of the art and stuff. Um, a couple of clever moments. Um, something I, I wanted to mention in particular, I'm just sort of trying to find the page at the moment, uh, where one of the characters goes to, to talk to, um, uh, what's the main character's name? Is it? Is it? Shaka. What's his Shaka. name? Yeah, um, and somebody's going to talk to him, and um, they're pretending to be invisible. But oh, I love that. Kneeling down, yeah. Which it, is this in the first issue? Because I'm just yeah, it's the first it. issue. And um, and then it's really cleverly done. When you get down to the bottom of the page, you see the 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 person who's sort of pretending to be a snake uh, is actually just kneeling down. Um, and then when holding you get a snake bottom, up. Yeah, and when you get to the bottom of the page, the panel shows that. It's really good, it's really clever. Um, so there are some really nice moments in it. It's just overall, it's just not for me because I hate precocious kids. But, um, but you know, I know some uh, differently about it. I really liked it, but I liked it only for, only for June the Loon. That invisible snake girl that wasn't invisible. June the Loon is the best thing in the book. There is, um, <laughs> Issue three or two has a scene where she's spying on the main character. There's a crowd of kids and he's in the middle of them and she's spying in the background. But each panel, she's in a different place. One minute she's just like in the crowd. Next she's hanging from uh, the ceiling. And another one, when he's walking away, she's just in the bin. You don't see her get <laughs> into this place. She's just there. And she's just so mental. It's just, And her hair is ridiculous. She's got an eye patch on and her hair is just two green bits of tufts hanging out that side of her head. Um... Just, just hilarious. Uh, and I only care for it. I think if June Loon wasn't in there, again, the, the, the characters do do your head in. There's a lot of like grumpy kids, angry kids. There's some dude called Rick the Stick. Should just be called Prick. Um, <laughs> they do your head in, but June Loon breaks it up really nice. When she comes in, it's so good. And I, the nurse, there's a mystery with the, the nurse. She's a bit of a psychic, but no one really knows her real name or anything. Um, which is kind of intriguing. All round, good. June the Louis should have been called. What about everyone else? I really liked all of it actually. I thought it was um, I thought it was really good. I read yeah, read the first three issues. I thought it was really playful. Um, I think the large reason I liked it was because of the art. When you had the um, you had the arrows showing people's eye gaze, and then you had arrows showing where their heads were moving. Things like that, I think, just made it. And the same thing as you were saying, June the Loon. Um, I sort of enjoyed Rick the Stick and the other guys as well, as along with all their ridiculous, silly names. But I just found it quite charming. Um, I don't mind precocious kids. I'm also reasonably happy reading school stories. Um, so, yeah, I, I found it really good fun. I would like to read more. Um, I'm not surprised that Fee didn't like it, because I think we have different opinions on certain comics. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, th- I thought it was fun. I'd like to read, it, read more next issues. Luke Sodders? Um, I, I blame Kevin Smith for this kind of thing, really. Uh, I, I can't... It, there's nothing 
incompetent about it, you know? It's, it's not like it's badly drawn or badly written. It's just really aggravating listening to, well, reading these incredibly smart-ass kids waffling on and explaining how clever they are and how dangerous they are. You just... It's like the argument that kids should have a mute button until they hit 18, you know? That, that's, that's what it reminded me of, reading this thing. And I don't have a problem with school stories. You know, I love the St. Trinian's movies. It's not even the genre. It's just these kind of precocious, overly verbose little shits blanging on about nothing. Just like... It's one of those things where you, you kind of hope that the fight between Clark and General Zod would crash through this comic and just stop it dead, you know what I mean? So, no, not one for me. Not incompetent, just fucking aggravating. That's my <laughs> review. I, I, I could not agree with that review more. Nice. Well, um, I thought it was alright. Um, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Someone is like, so you know, says Lucas. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think it was, you know, particularly amazing. You know, like you said, the, the kids were annoying. I liked. I like the idea, but um, but yeah, standout thing for me is probably June the Loon as well, only because she was using a snake to communicate, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> but other than that, it's just a bit boring, really, especially compared to the other two. That's uh, that's 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 my review. Thanks for that. even more insight there, Lucas. I you love know, you. My enthusiasm it. keeps the show going. <clears throat> It really does. Um, okay, and I do believe, unless anyone else got any more things to say, that that brings us to the end of this week's podcast. Am I in? Uh, am I right? Is everyone agreed? Yeah. Unfortunately so. It's that time again when we all say goodbye and me and Bert sing the f- Superman theme tune after everybody said goodbye. Yep, we're oh, all going to oh, say wait, goodbye. Wait, wait, guys, 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 sorry, I have to do this. I have to thank Charlotte for buying me comics this week and just taking me to see Man of Steel and getting me out of having to give DC any money to see the movie. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Jessica. Love I'm you going guys. to thank, thank you as well, because if you never took him, he wouldn't have actually liked the film, and we all wouldn't have gone speechlessly mind-blown. I so keep actually... saying this. I like good shit. Unfortunately, the 95% of the actual pop culture in the world is either competent or banal, trivial shit, and life is short enough to worry about getting excited about rubbish. Okie doke, uh, isn't there a thing next week, Sarah, that, uh, might be happening, or will there be happening? Thing. Um, Jeremy Whitley, who wrote Princeless, that we reviewed a few weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, I think we are all yeah. in the grievance, it was amazing, he will hopefully be joining us as a guest next week, so stay tuned. That's something to look forward to, big time stylish. Okay, and before me and Lucas give you a pleasant treat of our vocals, we're gonna just say, Follow us on Twitter at, at Radio Banff. Like us on Facebook at uh, Banff Comic Book Radio UK, I think. Um, we're all individually on uh, Twitter. I'm Bert under Lion Kempson. Do you want to give it? Fee, who are you? Uh, Fee McBee. Nebs, who are you? Uh, at Nebs underscore a go underscore go. Lucas, who are you? I am at Lucas Maxted. Sarah, who are you? I'm at Saranga Comics. And that's how you run down Twitter names. Like us, subscribe to us, go to our YouTube channel. We've also got videos on there from our MCM adventures. We've got this podcast if you want to listen to it there, so you can like our videos. Um, go to We Are Arcade to check out us, uh, Anime, Anime UK, the lovely girls over there. Um, this week had an interview with a Brony fan, a part of the Brony community. And soon <laughs> we'll even be getting... What are you laughing at? You're a Brony big time. We all know you are. Um... A, and and also player. coming out of nowhere, sh- soon should be a goddamn with me maybe guesting. We're trying to work out uh, stuff on that. And yes, that is it. That's all of us. Love us, like us, tell your friends about us. Because, um, you know, we tell people about you all the time. And now, Lucas, it's come to that moment that we said we was going to do, but I'm slightly regretting it. Okay, no. On one. Three, two, one. You can join in, guys. Superman! No one's joined in. Well, that's that's good. Anyway, Fee, say goodbye. Goodbye. Sarah, say goodbye. Goodbye. Ev, say goodbye. See you later.
And this is me and Bert both saying goodbye. Oh. <laughs> www.wearearcade.com Release the world engine! Release the world engine! Release the world engine! Release the world engine!